last talk of the morning. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to present Elena Popa that will give us a talk, present a talk entitled Mechanism, <coughs> Activities and Biopsychosocial Causation. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'll be talking about mechanisms and activities, so some of these topics that have already been discussed earlier in the conference, but I'll be looking um, at a case from medicine, um, and particularly bringing together biological causes with uh, social and psychological ones. Um, so I'm first going to look at what the biopsychosocial model uh, of health and disease is, and then basically see where mechanisms fit in. Um, I'm then going to look more specifically at um, a model of mental disorders that explicitly uses mechanisms. So does the mechanistic property clusters account and try to expand that to, to broader uh, uses and very psychosocial causation. Um, and then I will look at one tech aspect regarding mechanisms um, and particularly the activity account. Um, and uh, I'll do so by looking <coughs> at a case study on IBS um, in global syndrome. Um, so to start with, uh, there are different models of health and disease. Now, the predominant model is the biomedical one, uh, which has been facing several lines of criticism. Uh, despite this, yeah, it's still the kind of standard uh, dominating model when we talk about disease. Um, one of the problems with this model is uh, the fact that uh, when we talk about causes of illness, usually uh, there are multiple causes and these causes are of different kinds. And just to use an example, if you're trying to find, let's say, the causes of heart disease, diet could be one. And diet essentially yeah, could be uh, explained in terms of biological and physiological processes. However, chronic stress is also a cause of um, heart disease, um, and in that case, it's not as, as straightforward to have a, a biological um, explanation of that. Uh, similarly, and maybe even more so, when we talk about mental disorders, let's say major depressive disorder, um, you have uh, the basically chemical imbalance theory um, that essentially explains uh, depression through chemical processes, but depression is also linked to adverse life circumstances. Um, many variables have been linked to, to depression, so this could be unemployment, job insecurity, loneliness, and again, it's not as straightforward how these could be part of um, biological uh, processes and how they could be subject to biomedical um, science. Uh, so, yeah, the underlying question is how to account for causality across these different domains and also these different levels. Because, yeah, we're talking about multiple levels here, chemical, biological one, psychological, social. And the broader problem in the background here, which is relevant, but uh, I'm not going to discuss it unless it comes up in the Q&A, is how to conceptualize health and illness. Maybe yeah, health and illness are not merely biological or biomedical concepts, but um, they, they have a broader range. Um, so a bit of background for this. So the biopsychosocial model was introduced as a response to the problems that the biomedical uh, model has been facing starting with the 70s, but it didn't quite take over. One of the initial objections to it was its vagueness. So you say, oh, yes, disease is not only biological, but there are also this psychological, the social aspects of it, but you do it in this hand wave kind of way without exploring any actual causal pathways and any <coughs> approaches. So that has been one, one of the initial critiques of it. Uh, but there's more criticism. So yeah, in one of the recent works on, on the topic, the, this model was deemed as lacking content, validity, and coherence. Uh, now, my starting point is a recent defense of the biopsychosocial model by Walton and Gillett. Um, and one of the main things that Walton and Gillett make in their book <coughs> is that actually some of the insights from the biopsychosocial model have been uh, realized in uh, medical research on social determinants of illness. So the model is not as vague. 
um, incoherent as, as its critics would claim, and actually, yeah, some of these lines of, of research um, are present in, uh, in current medicine. Uh, but they point out the need to do more philosophical and particularly metaphysical work to ground this model. Um, so Walter and Gilbert make this claim that for much medical research, um, reductive physicalism is still the go-to ontology. Um, but this doesn't yeah, quite match the social determinants of illness and biopsychosocial um, model. So we kind of need to move beyond that. Um, again, this is broader than the scope of my talk here. What I would like to do today is to focus on the problem of causality. Causality is obviously connected to this ontological kind of background. Um, so, uh, yeah, in the book, Bolton and Gilbert mentioned both interventionism and mechanisms. So these are two of the main contemporary approaches to causation. Um, one benefit of interventionism that has been singled out, and again this is in the context of causality in uh, psychiatry, um, is that it can account for causation across domains and levels without looking in, into how that's possible, ontologically speaking. So if you wiggle, let's say, I don't know, things like job insecurity or unemployment, then you have a uh, state of mental health of uh, people exposed to these things also changing with that. So, uh, interventionism would not ask so how exactly what is the pathway from secure employment to better mental health or from unemployment to uh, worse mental health prospects. So that has been kind of sold as an advantage of interventionism. Um, and in the context of Bolton and Gillett's book, interventionism has also been suggested um, as a way of avoiding certain metaphysical questions that regard normativity in nature. Because if you have a normative concept of disease or illness, then yeah, questions <coughs> about normativity in nature also arise. Um, still, this, despite these kinds of suggestions, um, both and let's say that the experimental method, and this is well, basically what they mean by uh, interventionism, um, is not enough for theorizing the bi biological, psychological, and social. So interventionism gives you these variable names, but it doesn't tell you exactly what these things are and then how they cause one another. So to answer this how question, essentially <coughs> uh, we need mechanisms. So one of my claims here, basically a drawing from um, Bolton's point, uh, is that mechanisms are needed for a biopsychosocial model of uh, health and disease particularly yeah, when we're talking about causation. Um, so again, in the book, um, the example that Bolton and Gillett use is that of stress as a cause. Again, they mention causation, but not into as much detail. So what I'm going to do first is try to explain how this works according to the um, mechanistic model. Uh, and here's a quotation basically explaining how um, stress uh, affects health and I've highlighted there things that could be entities and activities in a, um, in a mechanistic model. So I'll read part of this and, and highlight the components of the mechanism. So a good way of thinking about stressful person environment relationship is to examine the relative balance of forces between environmental demands and the person's psychological resources. So these could be the entities that we have here. So environmental demands, psychological resources. If the environmental load substantially exceeds the person's resources, the stressful relationship exists. In psychological stress, the comparison is between the power of the environmental demands to harm, threaten, or challenge the psychological resources of the person to manage. So these entities basically have this kind of activities. Uh, so demands can challenge, can harm, uh, whereas, yeah, by using um, psychological resources, one can manage um, particular demands. Um, in this particular quotation is not mentioned, but uh, probably, yes, also in the uh, Lazarus book, uh, but in other more recent research as well, uh, hyperactivity that results from this inability to meet environmental demands is also linked to um, the inflammation, uh, which is basically a pathway from, again, psychological and social uh, variables to biological ones, and so diseases that are linked to inflammation. 
Um, and yeah, this is my sketch of the causal connection here. So social demands that deplete or challenge psychological resources. This leads to this feeling of uncontrollability, leads to hyperactivity, leads to inflammation, which down the line can lead to, to things such as heart disease, um, also psychiatric disorders, um, and other health effects. Um, so now, yeah, this was my, my sketch for mechanism, but I would like this picture to be a bit more complex, so I'm also going to look at mechanistic property clusters. Uh, mechanistic property clusters were introduced as a way of understanding mental disorders, and one of their benefits is that they can encompass multiple kinds of mechanisms that work together in accounting for a complex illness. So, Again, this would be mental illness, but my claim here is that we can move beyond that and use the mechanistic property clusters for other complex kind of illnesses. Um, and here's a description from the um, Kendler et al. article. Members of uh, mechanistic property uh, cluster kinds are not similar merely uh, in their superficial properties, but because the co-occurrence of these properties from individual to individual is explained by causal mechanisms that regularly ensure um, these properties are instantiated together. These mechanisms typically span several levels. So we have mechanisms and we also have a multitude of levels here, so that's relevant. Here, so the image on the left is the illustration from the Kendler et al. article. You can see these causes, some of which have this cyclical kind of uh, mutually reinforcing structure. You see the underlying state, so the underlying state here could be, let's say, something like major depressive disorder. The causes could be some of these environmental, psychological sort of causes. And then you also have the manifestations, which would be the, the symptoms of the disease. And again, they are self-reinforcing, which um, uh, sort of mutually reinforcing, which is something that happens in, in mental disorders. Uh, on the right, uh, I sketched out the simplified um, picture of uh, some of the considerations about uh, stress um, as a, um, a, a challenge to, to health. So you have this dynamic between increased environmental demands, decreased resources, and yes, as the resources decrease, the demands uh, that one is not able to meet also increase, and then this fits into uncontrollability, uh, generating this underlying stress of uh, chronic stress. Um, and then stress further produces these other effects, like inflammation, high blood pressure, hyperactivity, and as you can see, yes, so some of these are behavioral, some of these are um, physiological, um, some of these are psychological, so you have these uh, different levels and, um, and domains represented here. Um, so now, yes, I'm, I'm moving towards the more uh, metaphysical part of the, the picture here. Uh, because So we saw we need mechanisms for the biopsychosocial model. We can talk about complex diseases or pathways to um, uh, disease from this perspective of mechanistic property clusters, which helps incorporate multiple levels and domains. But what are mechanisms and what exactly are the parts that we put together um, in these models. Um, and yeah, this is just a, a review from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. When we talk about mechanisms, they're the classic kind of uh, Sam and Doe um, approaches, looking at conserved quantity. Uh, there are the mechanistic accounts, there are the activity-based accounts, and counterfactual accounts. For my purposes here, I'll focus on the activity-based accounts, chiefly because I think and yeah, I'm happy to discuss this in the Q&A if you disagree, but I think this is the more uh, metaphysically rich picture. So some of the defenders of mechanisms uh, have dropped the we'll talk about activities, partly because it's too obscure and too metaphysical, but I think there is a benefit in, uh, in keeping them and in exploring this further. Um, so just a brief explanation of what activities are. Um, Causal mechanisms um, consist in what's called uh, productive activities, and then productive activities are understood in, in Anscombe's sense. Um, yeah, I don't want to go into Anscombe scholarship here, so briefly, um, she defines causation as derivativeness of an effect from its causes. So the idea is that 
pauses somehow produce their <coughs> effect. And this is basically an activity, so it's not something that's passive, it's not something, again, that you don't really know. So you wiggle and you see whatever else wiggles that would be the interventionist picture. Rather, it is a productive kind of process. And uh, here is Merkinberg definition, for instance. Activities are the happening stuff, singularly or in concert with other activities, produce changes in or bring into existence other entities and or activities. Activities are ways of acting, processes or behaviors. They are active rather than passive, dynamic rather than static. And yeah, this is relevant when we talk about uh, health and disease causation because you have also these dynamic processes at, um, at play. Um, now, this has not been without criticism. As you can see, activities can produce entities, but then other activities as well, right? So this is getting kind of um, complicated. Um, so yeah, one critique is that activities have not really been analyzed, but you have there is a description. Um, <clears throat> then people saying that the, this is actually vacuous, so you're not really saying anything. Um, and one answer to this is an Glennon's book on the new mechanistic of philosophy uh, explaining uh, activities through lower level mechanisms. <coughs> so here's a, a quotation. Activities cannot naturally be reduced to properties of or relations between entities. So it's clear that uh, activities are, in a way, metaphysically basic in this account of mechanisms. And they are causes in the sense that it is entities engaging in activities that are the producers of change. So again, activities are necessary for um, causation. And then Glennon also talks about mechanism dependence, <coughs> namely that the system's activity is constituted by a set of acting and interacting parts. So you can basically break down an activity and look at its parts, and that kind of explains this, uh, at least addresses partly this worry that activities are not further analyzed and that they may be vacuous. They're not vacuous, so if you're interested, you can look into what goes on there and you can explain it in terms of um, interacting parts. Um, so now let's look at this in relation to case study. Um, so irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, is a symptom-based diagnosis. It has certain requirements. That the ones that are listed here are um, chronic abdominal discomfort or pain. Um, and abnormal function, but other gastrointestinal symptoms are also common. Um, now, I got this um, model of how the, the nervous system is involved in IBS, um, and essentially what you have here is a, a complex kind of mechanism, um, and you have two pathways, uh, one that involves uh, basically top-down stress um, that affects the, the central nervous system, the HPA axis, um, and then it leads to, uh, to an immune response um, to the enteric nervous system, which feeds back into the central nervous system. So we have this mutually reinforcing kind of network. Um, yeah, this is the image. Um, this is yeah, the, the explanation. Um, of these processes, so chronic stress affects uh, amygdala and hippocampus function, uh, which affect basically the HPA axis, resulting in low-grade um, inflammation and immune response. So that's the top-down mechanism, and the bottom-up mechanism is inflammation in the entire nervous system that leads to the changes in the, the function of the um, central nervous system. Um, and yeah, breaking this down, as entities here, we have the components of the yeah, central nervous system. Um, and as activities, we have this response and regulation um, that happen. For the bottom uh, up mechanism, there are the, the components of the enteric nervous system. And then for activities, we have inflammation, function. And again, these two, so the top down and the bottom up, are mutually reinforcing. Um, so they, they feed into one another, generating basically this kind of underlying state. Uh, so I did not draw a diagram for this. So essentially, you can see this part here as one of the, the components here. 
um, essentially because, yeah, so this looks at the neural pathways, whereas here you would need, let's say, mechanisms that are involved in stress. Here, maybe other things that are going on uh, in the organism at the same time. So yes, this would be a part of this. Um, so you can, yeah, essentially view it as a mechanistic property cluster because you have this underlying state. So this, the symptoms that uh, I mentioned, like pain, discomfort, uh, decreased function. Um, but then you have, yes, so um, top-down stress and then uh, response to inflammation and immune response. So essentially you could frame this as a mechanistic property cluster. Um, so trying to zoom in now on uh, how to understand these mechanisms, um, at least in, in the model that I've been using, the activities here are uh, neural. Um, so you have, yes, so essentially a response from the central nervous system and from the enteric nervous system and this mutually reinforcing pattern. But yeah, if we want to think about this in, in a biopsychosocial model, uh, the question here is how about um, psychological or social causes? And there is work basically suggesting that, for instance, psychological interventions such as cognitive behavioral therapy is more effective in IBS than in other um, gastrointestinal uh, illnesses. And this is explained basically because it's uh, off, very often comorbid with psychiatric conditions and stress response is, is one, of, um, one of its symptoms. Um, so given that, yes, there are psychological interventions available, there is a connection when we talk about symptoms and, and causation uh, with regard to, to psychological variables. So do we talk about them as entities and maybe have the same kind of activities, like neural kind of activities, or do we talk about activities at the psychological and social level as well? If so, what does this say about the mechanisms that are involved? So. Yes, so the only lower level parts that we have in this model are neural, but we need more complexity here. Um, one thing to stress is that this is compatible with the mechanism dependence claims, because you can have, yes, so this activity, technically, yeah, this top down uh, mechanisms could be explained through these activities um, that are neural, but then can we also speak of other lower level activities, for instance, cognitive uh, activities that link social demands to resources. So if one is under uh, excessive cognitive load uh, because of, uh, of environmental demands, does that again change behavior? Does that lead to, to physiological changes as well? And yeah, the broader pattern here is the top down dysregulation, which has been pointed out with regard to chronic stress, uh, but perhaps other uh, social and psychological um, processes as well, but yes, yeah, it's, it's the best documented with regard to, to stress. Um, and then the further question here is, if we have mechanistic property clusters to, to explain uh, these uh, pathways to, to disease, um, we could have, as, just as we have different mechanisms, let's say top down and bottom up, we can have mechanisms that involve different kinds of activities, so neural, but also psychological, social, maybe others. So the, the underlying question again is how to integrate them. So even if we bring them together in this complex kind of picture. Um, so yeah, this is basically the question. So this is um, work in progress. Um, to conclude, um, the biopsychosocial model and causal explanations featuring social determinants of illness have implications for causality, and yeah, among others, I have argued that mechanisms are needed uh, for this model. Um, then the activity account of mechanistic causation can explain <coughs> um, health effects uh, such as uh, those of chronic stress. Um, and then if we use mechanistic property cluster, we can bring together different uh, types of variables and different types of mechanisms. And with respect to the, the case of IBS, in particular, top-down and bottom-up mechanisms can be explained through neural activities, but there are questions about how they would relate with different types of activities and how they would be integrated with them. Um, thank you for your attention. You have the references here. <laughs> Thank you.
plenty of time for questions, comments. Thanks a lot for the talk. I think that's a, an excellent idea. Um, you're, you're working out here. Uh, I wonder if you could say a bit more about what such, uh, if I understand it correctly, there are biopsychosocial mechanisms, right? And, um, and they, they include um, components or activities from uh, at various levels and, uh, as it were, crossing uh, disciplinary boundaries. Um, I wonder if you could say more about what such a biopsychosocial mechanism actually explains. Does it explain the occurrence, um, specific occurrences of a, of, of a disease, or, or um, what, what exactly do they explain? So what is the, pheno the exponential phenomenon here? Right. Uh, I think occurrence, yes, it could be, but I would say rather the persistence of a disease, because I think this is what happens with diseases that look basically chronic and involve these kinds of pathways. Right. Uh, and then, I mean, I'm also interested in interventions on these diseases. Because at least with CBT, one thing that, when it's successful, that it does is that it gets people in a different way of framing the kind of situations they're in. So you can, if you view it as this mechanistic cluster kind of thing, you remove that and then somehow the underlying state will change. But it's difficult to tell because, yes, maybe other things are at play. Uh, but I'm interested, yes, so not only occurrence of disease, but persistence of disease, and then maybe implications for treatment, and explaining how, yes, psychological or social interventions can help address some of these diseases. Also, because, yeah, this has been modeled on psychiatry, but I think it could be expanded since there are, yeah, social determinants of other types of illnesses. Thank you. Another? Daniel? Yeah, thank you. This is, I found this really, really interesting. But maybe, but I wonder if I could maybe open up a bigger conversation. Um, it occurs to me that when, that the philosophy that you're deploying, okay, so the philosophy that you're deploying feels very familiar me as an outsider, so it's like stuff I hear all the time in philosophy of biology. But I also, as I hear you laying out your case study, it occurs to me like, boy, in like, historians of medicine, we will talk about diagnostics, pathology, and therapeutics in ways that are totally alien to anything I talk about as a historian of biology. And so I'm wondering if you could give me some help in assessing like where do the philosophy of biology and the philosophy of medicine for you as in this in these case studies, where do these meet? Where do they where are they incompatible? Is there is there a reason you prefer to be working with the set of tools that philosophers of biology are really comfortable with? I, this is a pretty vague question. I'm just wondering about like, the, <coughs> the landscape of philosophy, the, the landscape of philosophy, why you're some, not why, but yeah, some ideas about where you're positioning yourself. Okay, so just to, to kind of try to specify this a yeah. bit, so you're referring to mechanisms as tools of philosophers of biology. I do have that intuition, but I don't know if that's that's only that's because I don't hang out with other philosophers or anything. Uh, no, I think there is something there, but I think mechanisms are becoming increasingly popular with philosophers of medicine. Um, because I mean yes so and if you address biology with medicine when you talk of, because yeah in medicine you talk about health and illness. Right, and then that does bring up questions. Yeah, normativity in nature, but again, you have normativity in nature for functions in biology as well. So I think there are a lot of common topics. I think mechanisms work well for medicine. If you talk about yes, causality in medicine, you also want to explain how a certain disease comes about, um, and then what to intervene on again. You need but then, of course, we have the 
so randomized controlled trials that are used in drug testing and so on, and that involves the interventionist concept of causation, but that is maybe not so much if you look at doctors and scientists and so on, but if you look at philosophers working on this, that's under heavy attack. So I think the way to go is some version of pluralism. People don't agree on what kind of pluralism, but in my view, mechanisms should, should definitely be there. Um, I, don't, I hope I made it somewhat clear with this talk, but I have other <laughs> arguments in my favor of uh, mechanisms. So we have a causation in a way that goes beyond this kind of statistical patterns that you can notice well. Sorry, we have to think about causation that goes beyond? Beyond I just the think intervention is kind of invariance thing. So you also need to see what's going on, so what kind of variables you have. Yes, if you want, yeah, entities and activities, relations, you can involve the disposition. There is, I think, an emerging strand of literature also talking about dispositions. Glennon in his book mentions it, but he says obviously activities are better. Um, I'm not really taking a stance on that, but I think you need something along those lines that goes beyond the interventionist kind of concept. But I'm not sure if I, because I don't, I think interventionism is I can ask people. Yeah. <laughs> is it a big thing in biology as well? Unrelated, but I was wondering if you think that is there room in your account for um, evolutionary explanations of disease, uh, for example, involving a mismatch between um, our, our current environments and our evolutionary environments, or the kinds of stress that we face now versus the kinds of stress that our stress response evolved to deal with? Is that something that could be incorporated in this kind of? I think it could. I'll have to think because yes, yeah, so there are these emerging accounts, including again of mental illness. So the kind of evolutionary processes and uh, people being adapted for certain kinds of environments and those don't work well in, in other environments. Um, but of course, there are questions: evolutionary time, and then, so these whole things that are brought against uh, evolutionary accounts. Maybe, because I think there is something to mental illness as a kind of adaptation. And again, if you look at PTSD, for instance, people who have been in traumatic circumstances and then are moved in other circumstances which are not traumatic are going to have difficulty adapting and again have some psychological processes there. And this doesn't necessarily need to be um, evolutionary. So I would say my account is open to that. I don't want to go into the <laughs> debate of yeah, what happens to the brain many years on whether we can talk about yeah similar neural pathways and so on as you did I don't know how many <laughs> thousands of years ago. That's something I don't want to go into, but I think this uh, structure of explanation would be available. So adaptation to, to a certain environment and then moving the yeah the stressors in the different kinds of environments. That makes sense. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the really interesting talk. And I've been really um, interested in hearing how you, you're kind of playing mechanism and interventionism off of each other. And I guess I'm just trying to get a clearer picture of what uh, your goal is for the project. Do you do you see yourself as sort of convert like landing on what you think is going to be the, like the the right sort of causal account for this? Um, and if so, I mean you 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 know sort of gestured with pluralism, but I wonder if. Uh, you, like, if you think that uh, there is a sort of correct way of cashing out causes in biopsychosocial medicine, and <coughs> if there is, then what sort of makes that the right way of cashing them out? Thank you. Uh, I, I think I can say I don't think there is one way, one right way of cashing out causes. So it's not in this talk, but. In another talk I've given like a month ago, you have these questions of causal models, how to choose models, how to choose variables, um, which again has been partly discussed in relation to objectivity and so on by views yeah, such as Woodward, for instance, but I don't think it's been discussed at the length that it deserves. 
because I think, yes, the kind of causal model you use and the kind of variable that you use does depend on your purposes. And then we need to think, so what do we want medicine to do? Yeah. Um, and my motivation for this is especially because, yeah, so the biopsychosocial model has been brought forward to counter the neglect of social and psychological causes of illness, the promotion of biomedical interventions only, and so this has social, ethical, political kind of implications. And I think, yeah, if you think about causation causal models in a way that you want to address some of these shortcomings, then if you're clear about the goals, um, and then again, if you say, yeah, we want to improve overall health, and there is this big social determinant that usually gets neglected, so maybe we should address that, then yeah, you can use a model that will involve that. So I don't think there is the one right way. And then, and yeah, this brings me to the question of evidence that I mentioned before, because if you focus only on RCPs, then certain, yeah, the pill kind of treatments are always going to be ranked higher because you can do the blind trial since the one, you cannot do a truly blind trial for psychotherapy or exercise. Uh, so if you end up with this evidence hierarchy that uh, privileges RCPs, um, then you're going to miss some of these, yeah, social, ethical kind of implications. So that's kind of my motivation. So I would resist, yeah, the current evidence hierarchy, seeing, saying that's the right way to think about causation in medicine, but what the right picture would look like would be far more complex. So it wouldn't be one right way, if that makes sense. Do you have another one? No, we can just talk later. I have one which is uh, provocative uh, volunteer. What do you think of the hypothesis that in philosophy of medicine now they are talking about mechanisms because scientists began to model with boxes and arrows? <laughs> because, and if you model with boxes and arrows, you get to mechanism. And why it's coming from? Because I, 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 I work with economists to teach causality in economy, and they don't use, for example, Bayesian networks mathematics, which is completely applicable to them, because they dislike graph with bubble and arrow. That's what the economists said to me. Yeah, there's something fishy with these models with arrows and boxes. Did you see in the historical that oh, these kind of uh, graphs appear? Because they appear a long time ago in biology, in boxes and arrows and you know metabolic stuff. But maybe it's more recent in medicine. Really, I was very struck by the IBE, uh, no, uh, irritable bowel S graph. Ideas. That's a graph that you know see that. I didn't know philosophy of med uh, people in medicine was doing about disease, not about metabolic blah blah blah. But really, these are the different factors that could be important for that kind of disease, and that's complex with stress stuff, not just uh, metabolic pathways or something. Thank you. I, I didn't think about that, so that's something that so I cannot say historically so when they started becoming a thing. I can say so. When the causality started to be more like this invariance under intervention, so that's with the uh, evidence based medicine mm -hmm. movement, okay. which went not that far away, so sometime in the 90s. And then, but that's a direct implication of different types of evidence, and the ones that you rank the highest mm -hmm. involves these kinds of causal models. Before that, because you have, for instance, expert opinion, and then your expert opinion, let's say as a doctor, could be based on some graph of mechanism, but would you draw it like that? Um, or lab studies and so on, so all these things that are ranked lower. Um, so that that's something that I should look up historically, because I think maybe, yeah, I think there is something there. So when did these uh, kinds of graphs start? That, that would connect with Kayla. You know, certain practices push you towards certain Conceptual frameworks. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I did not. Yeah, just a, a response to this, a follow-up to this. Um, ha hasn't physiology been using boxes and arrows yeah. for a long time, yeah. which is sort of an in integral part of medicine? So uh, I don't know about you know, disease, cause I don't know. You know, I don't know anything about medicine. 
So this is where I, one of the reasons why I had my questions. Because yes, physiology is integral to medicine, but it is one part of medicine, right? When we're talking about therapeutics, you know, if I as a physician have a patient with irritable bowel syndrome, I, a good physician is going to say, do this and this and this, possibly with incommensurable reasons. I mean, this, this is what a good, this is what a good physician delivering, delivering therapy looks like. Even if, I, I think you're right to insist on like this point about biomedicine being a particular paradigm of medicine that holds physiological reasoning to be more important and at the same time less pluralistic than what is possible typically in therapy. Mm -hmm. do you, do, so do you like the, the, so this is one of the reasons why I'm interested in like the way you're like framing this as one biomedical package, right? Because there's something. Sorry, I, I only have unorganized thoughts about this, but this point about like, boxes and diagrams. Actually, if you do like in certain subfields of evidence-based medicine, quote unquote, the boxes and diagrams are about, are about decision making processes in therapeutics, which is tracking how different kinds of experts are passing the patient along in these chains and where certain kinds of diagnostic practices get used, where they're misused, where assumptions about mechanisms lead to unhealthy outcomes, or stuff like this. So I think this is, this is a huge, sorry, I'll stop talking. So you want more conceptual clarity? Because I mean, it's there, but it's been there before. Certain diseases have been reconceptualized because certain treatments have been found. So stretching being one of them. So it's been there before. This kind of messiness when you talk about treatment, explanation of disease, uh, causation of disease. I think this package has been there. So this is not, I think, a recent thing. So you try to understand the disease, and then there are these multiple ways of doing that, and then say, oh, we can treat that with antibiotics, so it must be this kind of disease, we can treat it with this. But, but perhaps more than that, but in medicine, interventionism, or intervention means different things. Like, there's, a, there's an intervention in the experimental context, and then there's intervention in the therapeutic context. And they just, fund, they're fundamentally, I think they're fundamentally, Mm, if you have a randomized control trial, of course, if you're in the control group, this can be fundamentally different from receiving <coughs> medication. But the if you have a control group, we'll continue this discussion with a sandwich in our hand. <laughs> <laughs>